I am a physical therapist by background. I come from Melbourne in Australia and it's been a great privilege for me to hear so many of your stories over the last day or so and I can tell you that your stories are quite similar to the experiences of patients in Australia. Uh, some of the challenges are very similar as well. So I think we all have a long way to go but hopefully we're moving in the right direction. So it's my job to talk today about pulmonary rehab and oxygen therapy. I know that uh, some of you would have heard me talk about pulmonary rehab yesterday, so hopefully I won't cover too much of the same ground, but uh, it is a very central part of pulmonary fibrosis care. So um, here we go again. So what we're talking about in this session, I think, this afternoon is, is living well with pulmonary fibrosis and what tools do we have to help people to live well. So that can mean a number of different things to different people. So we've talked this morning in the plenary session about the fact that in trials at the moment, measures of lung function are, are often used as the primary outcome of the trials, and that's very important, but it might not reflect the full range of um, experiences that people have and the, the things that are important to them in terms of the way they live and the way they feel. So of course symptoms are very important and reducing symptoms uh, is a critical part of treatment. But I've put a whole range of other things up there that might be an important part of living well for you and of course there may be other different things that are important to living well for you as well. So what I'm talking about here with pulmonary rehab and oxygen is uh, falls into the realm of supportive therapies for pulmonary fibrosis. So those are therapies that aim to improve wellness. So they're things that reduce symptoms, they improve your physical condition, hopefully they enhance your ability to undertake the activities that are important to you in your daily life, improve knowledge and confidence and provide some kind of support. So for these supportive therapies, the major aim is not to reduce disease progression, as it might be with some of the, the pharmacological therapies we've just heard about, but rather these therapies are aiming to improve quality of life and uh, the well-being uh, in the way that you live your life. So pulmonary rehab and oxygen therapy really have key roles in this regard for pulmonary fibrosis. So pulmonary rehab is a program which has exercise and education in it, and it's improve, designed to improve both the physical and the psychological condition of people with chronic respiratory diseases. And you can see here, this is a picture of our program in my hospital in Melbourne, uh, and it probably looks pretty similar to many of the programs that you have been uh, attending uh, in your centres as well. So when you attend pulmonary rehab, what would you expect? Well, you would expect that you would have a one-on-one -on -one assessment. That would usually be uh, with the medical director of the program and also with somebody who would assess your exercise capacity. There would be an exercise program which is tailored individually and specifically for you. So starting with exercises that you can achieve easily at the start of the program so that you're comfortable with them and increasing over time such as the, you get fitter and stronger over time. And that there would be monitoring whilst you exercise. So that would be things like monitoring your heart rate and oxygen saturation but also other important things like your symptoms and your comfort during exercise so that the exercise is tolerable for you and that it's something that you feel that you can continue. Another important of pulmonary rehab is developing a home exercise program. The supervised aspect of pulmonary rehab is really just the start of something which we hope will be a, a lifelong uh, commitment to keeping fit and strong. So a home exercise program is a re really key element of that and I'll re revisit that later. And in general you'd expect to be in a group that contains patients with a wide range of diagnoses and disease severity. So pulmonary rehab has really come out of uh, COPD and emphysema, so uh, there's often a number of patients with those sort of sorts of diagnoses in the group, but it's opening much more widely now to people with a whole range of chronic lung conditions. So it's likely that not only will you see people who might be uh, sicker or more well than you are, but that they might have different lung conditions as well. Even more specifically, with pulmonary rehab, you would generally expect that it would be an eight to 12 week program. It would be an outpatient program, so that means you don't need to be admitted to the hospital. That's certainly the case uh, in North America and Australia. Uh, in some programs in Europe, you do actually get admitted for a little while. Usually you have to attend two or three times a week and the frequency is important. We know that if it drops down to only once a week that we don't get the same sorts of benefits in terms of your strength and fitness at the end. So it's important to be able to attend that number of times. 
The components of the, the exercise usually include some walking training and maybe some stationary cycle training, but also some light weights for your arms and legs to try and improve the muscle condition. And there might maybe some other forms of physical training as well, things like stretching and flexibility exercises or balance exercises. You should also expect that you'll get information on a wide range of different topics that are relevant to people with chronic lung disease. So I've listed some of those there. And you, you will um, get a bit of variability in the topics that are covered depending on the program that you go to. And that's really about uh, the people who are available at your centre and the types of uh, topics that they can cover. But they're really the core ones that I've put up there. Importantly, how should you feel at the end? Well, at the end of rehab, most people will experience improved exercise capacity, and we try and capture that and measure it with some kind of exercise test. For most rehab programs, it's probably a six-minute walk test, which you're very familiar with. And what we would expect after rehab is that you would have some kind of meaningful improvement in your six-minute walk test. So, you know, another lap or two of the corridor would be something that you'd be able to do at the end. You should have reduced breathlessness, improved energy levels and improved quality of life. And again, we try and measure some of those things with questionnaires. One of the important things I think to know about pulmonary rehab is that pulmonary rehab does not actually change what happens in your lungs because what happens in your lungs is part of the, the pathological process of pulmonary fibrosis. But what it does do is it improves everything around it. So it improves the way your heart functions, the efficiency of your circulation, how well you get oxygen to your muscles and how well you take away the waste products, uh, how strong your muscles are and how efficiently they work. So actually all of those things ha can have a really profound impact on your breathlessness. So just by improving those things, actually we know that we can significantly reduce shortness of breath for many people. One of the things that's a real challenge with pulmonary rehab is making sure that the benefits that you achieve out of, it, out of it at the end of the program are continued later on. And this is a graph that I showed yesterday, actually, from one of our studies. And what you see here is the, the line at the top is the people who've done pulmonary rehab. And you can see that their walk distance goes up at the end of the program quite significantly. But then it comes back down again six months later. Whilst we don't know exactly why this occurs, we suspect that some of it is around the fact that people um, don't continue their exercise to the same extent as they did whilst they were in the program. So some of it might be disease progression, but there really wasn't much of that in this trial. So we think it's more likely that people don't have the same confidence and ability and motivation to continue with their exercise afterwards. So it is really important during pulmonary rehab to establish that home program that you can then continue after you leave the program and keep working on that on a two or three times a week basis. So it's good to test that out whilst you're at pulmonary rehab. Talk to your trainer about what might work for you in the longer term. Have a go at it and have somebody troubleshoot it with you so that by the time you graduate from your pulmonary rehab program, you're really confident about what you're going to do into the future. Some key messages about pulmonary rehab. It is really never too early to start pulmonary rehab. It's something that I think is easier to do often if you start it early. So sometimes people say to us, oh, I'm too well. I don't really need it. Actually, it might be easier to get into it and get the routine started earlier rather than waiting until you feel like you're much sicker and you might need it. So get started, get the routine happening, work out how you can stay in fit, as fit and strong as you can. So never too early. It may also be possible to go back to rehabilitation if you need it later on. So if your circumstances change, if for some reason you become less well than you were when you did rehab and you're struggling with your home program, for some people, depending on your coverage, it may be possible to go back and redo the program again. So get that personal trainer input again and have a, a touch up, if you like, of your exercise program and your education and all of those things which will help you into the future. So let's move on now and talk about oxygen therapy. I think all of you are probably aware that pulmonary fibrosis does make it more difficult to get oxygen into the blood, and not only to get it into the blood, but from there to get it to the rest of the body, to the places that's needed, so your vital organs and also your muscles. I've put a graph here, which is uh, the graph of one of our patients during a six-minute walk test. So you can see here oxygen levels start nice and high, up near 100, and then there's a pretty rapid, rapid plunge over the first couple of minutes, and then it stays in their boots pretty much for the remainder of the test. And that's a fairly characteristic pattern, although that's on the extreme end. So very common to have decreased oxygen levels during exercise. It can also occur during sleep. And even for some, some people, when they're just sitting still, they might have low oxygen levels as well. So does oxygen therapy work? 
Well, actually, most of the information that we have about oxygen therapy is not generated in people with pulmonary fibrosis, actually. It's come from people with COPD. And there was a couple of major trials that were run some time ago which did show a survival benefit for people who used oxygen for a very large portion of the day. So these were people who had severe disease, who had low oxygen levels at rest, and if they wore it for more than 16 hours a day, it seemed to, to help them to live longer. So what do we know in pulmonary fibrosis? Well, we know in short-term studies, so this is studies where they test on the same day often or on the next day people wearing oxygen versus wearing air, that consistently there's improvements in exercise capacity. So people can walk for longer or cycle for longer on the oxygen than they can on the air. So that's a good thing. In terms of symptoms in these short-term studies, actually the effects are variable. So some people have a significant symptom benefit and other people don't seem to have much of a symptom benefit at all. And in fact, at the moment, we have no really good data on survival. So we don't really know about whether oxygen has an impact on survival in people with pulmonary fibrosis. We do know, however, a bit more about the experiences of people with pulmonary fibrosis when they're using oxygen therapy. So there's been some um, great research, this is stuff that's come out of the UK fairly recently, about how people experience the use of oxygen therapy. And they talk consistently about the oxygen giving them improved confidence, enabling them to be more active and to engage in the activities that are meaningful for them to feel more in control of what they're doing because they've got the oxygen and they no longer have that, that worry about their oxygen levels falling too low when they're doing the activities that they want to do. But they also talk about the constant worry about running out of oxygen and the challenges of managing the equipment. And I've put a couple of the quotes from patients down there um, around the fact that some oxygen has some great benefits. Uh, it's really an important part of management, but it also comes with some costs as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about managing those as the time goes on. So if you think about the role of oxygen therapy in pulmonary fibrosis... It is a tool that is there to assist you to do more of the things that you want, to do those things more comfortably and with more confidence. It may assist with a range of symptoms, but people do have some variable responses to this. So some people, as I said, report um, improvements in breathlessness, but actually other people um, report more that it improves their energy levels or it helps with their fatigue. Some people tell us that it helps their recovery after exercise, actually, so you know that they can do what they want to do and it's, they still get breathless, but actually they recover much more quickly and can go on to the next thing. It is, however, a trade-off around the inconvenience and the physical challenges of the equipment related to oxygen that we have at the moment. There are many oxygen devices around. I've just put a few of them here. So uh, we have fixed concentrators, which are the ones that people have in the home. Uh, they're great if you need to use oxygen overnight and if you need to use it around the house, um, but it's not a mobile device. It's really designed just to be in the home. So it's not something that can help you get out and about. So that's really for people who need to be on it in the home environment. Uh, we've got a picture of cylinders there in the, in the middle, which uh, many of you will be familiar with. They are great for going out, but they can run out and they can be very heavy. So they're quite difficult to get in and out of the car boot and they're really difficult to get upstairs and um, even up and down curbs and that sort of thing. Uh, portable concentrators, there's been really a, a huge growth in the portable concentrators that are available after the last, uh, over the last few years. These are more manoeuvrable, they are easier to use than the cylinders, um, they don't run out in the same way, although they do have very variable flow rates, not all portable concentrators are the same, so the specifications are very important and whether those specifications are right for you. And they also have variable battery life, so some of the batteries last longer than others. I thought I'd just talk briefly about oxygen flow because this is something often that clinicians talk a lot about for people with pulmonary fibrosis and it's a concept I think that is good to understand. So for any device, there's a limit to the amount of flow that it can deliver. So if you think of flow like flow down a river, um, it's the sort of the volume of oxygen that's actually been de being delivered at any one time. The important thing about flow uh, is whether it can actually meet your needs, particularly as you breathe faster and as you uh, have to exert yourself more. So this is a graph which shows what happens as your breathing rate goes up when you're using a cylinder on continuous flow. So on this y-axis here, we have the amount of oxygen. So up here is better, higher is better. 
and down the bottom we have the amount of flow that's being generated. So if we just look at the highest flow rate here, which is the setting of five litres a minute, which I've put a box around here, what we see here in the diamonds on the top line this is the amount of oxygen that's being delivered in every breath when you're breathing at 15 breaths per minute, which is actually pretty slow. But you can see what happens as you start to breathe faster, that the oxygen delivered in each breath goes down and then goes down and goes down again. And that bottom one there, which is the open circles, is 30 breaths a minute. So we know that for people with pulmonary fibrosis, they often do have a rapid and shallow breathing pattern. So this is something which becomes quite important. So situations where the oxygen flow rate from devices is sometimes not enough from pulmonary, for people with pulmonary fibrosis is in situations like exercise, sometimes during sleep overnight when the breathing can become more shallow, and even sometimes at rest for people who have a very rapid and shallow breathing pattern even when they're sitting down. Another situation where that can be important is where you have the pulsed oxygen supply or on demand. So the picture I've shown you is where the cylinder's just giving out oxygen all the time. But if you have a pulsed supply, it only pulses out the oxygen when it detects your breath. And that can mean that actually you're getting even less, and particularly as the breathing rate goes up, that can be a problem. This can also sometimes be a problem with portable concentrators. So some of them have the ability to generate a continuous flow and some do not, uh, and some generate more oxygen per pulse than others. So this is why the issue of um, matching the device for your particular needs becomes so important. And it's great to work with the person uh, who's setting up your oxygen, work with your clinicians, work you through your spiritual therapist to make sure that you've got the device that's best for you, that you've been tested on that device, and that we know that it actually delivers a enough oxygen that you need to do the activities that are important to you. So there's many options. They increase all the time. Uh, some of the options that you might have is you might have different types and sizes of cylinders. You might have options about whether you get a pulse dose or not. We had some discussion yesterday about the availability of liquid oxygen, which can be really important and beneficial if you have high flow requirements, but that's not available everywhere. And as I've said, there's different types of portable concentrators, not all of which deliver the same flow. There's also different types of tubing and nasal cannula that can be used, some of which have a reservoir device on them, and for those people who have high flow requirements, that can be really helpful because it's like a little extra bit of oxygen that can be there to inhale with every breath. So in summary, pulmonary rehab and oxygen therapy can contribute to living well with pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, one of my take-home messages is that it is never too early to start pulmonary rehab. And if you have the opportunity to go, I'd encourage you to, to go and get started early. And particularly to establish that long-term exercise program, which can keep you going over time and after you, after you leave the program. Oxygen therapy is there to help you do more physical activity, to help you get out and about, and it might also have a range of symptom benefits for you. And it's important to work with the person who's um, your healthcare professional to find the right device. Thanks very much.